Give the Lord a hand. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Let's go to the Lord. We celebrate through prayer and we celebrate through time of this uh, fellowship. No God like Jehovah. Father, we bless you this morning. Just thanking you that you are God. You are the God, the creator, our sustainer, our savior, our Lord, our redeemer. You are God. Lord, we welcome you into this time, in this place, Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for the very privilege. We talked about that this week in several different meetings. The very privilege to be able to join in the presence of worship of the Holy and Almighty God. It's a privilege. God, I want to bless you today. I pray that's the, that's the tune of every living, warm body in this place this morning, just to come and bless you because of all that you've done for us. Even this morning, for someone who's never placed their faith and trust in Jesus, God, if they look around and they see the beautiful thing called nature, if they, as they experience sunrises and sunsets, hot and cold, rain and no rain, God, that they begin to realize, look, there's somebody bigger than me. God, could it be today just that you reveal yourself to them like they've never seen before? God, I'm begging you, I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you to surprise us, to do greater things than we've ever seen before in, in our lifetime, God. Just continue to expound on that. Lord, I pray that we take worship serious. I pray that, God, if it takes meeting where we are, if it takes bowing where we are, if it takes coming to this altar, God, just to be ready for worship, to get our hearts in tune, God, with you, and God, just to allow you to worship, to minister to us, God, to just, that we can worship, and then through that worship, God, you touch our lives. God, you meet needs. God, there's hundreds of needs in this place. God, I pray right now we open our lives to you. You already know what's there. We just need to open up. We need to ask. We need to seek. God, we just need to be right where you want us to be. Lord, I pray for that today. Thank you for your watch care this week. Thank you for healing and surgery. Thank you for ministering in the midst of illness and disease and death. God, giving hope for tomorrow. Giving strength. God reminding us through little girls and little boys of what it means just to invite somebody to come and be with them. God, see it all come to fruition. God, may we catch that fire. May we catch hold to the kingdom of purpose, God. May we catch hold of this thing, a heart like yours. May we learn to love others like you love us, God. Teach us this morning how to do that. Teach us, God, how to pray for our enemies. Teach us how to, God, just minister to those who don't like us. In tough situations, God. As parents go through difficulties with kids or grandchildren and all of that. God, remind us of the power of God this morning. God, we're important. You've chosen us. You've called us. It's up to us to answer and walk in obedience. Holy Spirit of God, move like you've never seen before. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for life. Thank you for the teachings. Thank you for the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the life that's ours through your death, through your burial, through your resurrection. Freedom, liberty. That liberty is right here in your it's free. It's worship. It's life. And it's all because of you, Jesus. Lord, thank you. Teach us how to love. Teach us how to share. In Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Turn and greet those around you. All over the building. To have in giving. God, you blessed us with everything that we have so that we can bless others. God, I thank you for folks that answer the call and take their families. I don't know if our people could hear it, but that young man said, you know, I didn't go to seminary to go full-time ministry. I went to seminary to learn more about the Word. Once he learned the Word, God just spoke in his life and called him to plant a church in Toronto. God, I pray for a city, a country,
that is much lostness. And God, I pray for the hands of God on those missionaries. I pray, God, that we have opportunities to share on these weeks coming. That we'll do our part. That we'll fund. We'll help fund. That God will go if opportunity opens itself to us. God, help us this morning. Remind us, Lord, to give locally so the church can operate and the church can reach and do its ministry locally. And then give as we have opportunity to bless the kingdom. God, I ask you that. Draw us close. Minister through us during this time of worship. Thank you, Jesus. In your name.
He gave them a mandate to take and, and, and go and multiply, and replenish the earth, and, and take care of the earth. Matter of fact, he said, I'll give you dominion over the fish and the fowl and the cattle, the animals, and over all the earth. Think about that now. He put man in charge. Then we rock along and man gets far from God, so God destroys the earth. But the Word of God says that there was a guy who found favor in the Lord. His name was Noah. God's hands upon Noah. He gave him some instructions, and you know the story. Noah went in, he built a big boat. The flood came, flooded the earth, killed everything there except what was on the ark. And again, God tells Noah, you and your family go and you've got dominion over the fowl, the fish, and the animals, and over all the earth. Multiply, he said. Take care of the earth. Do what I've called you to do. God, at those points throughout history, handled, handed ministry off, handed stipulations off of men to take care of the earth, to handle kingdom principles. You fast forward to the New Testament. You fast forward to God not saying a word for 400 years again, just being disgusted with man, and all of a sudden, we open the gospel. Jesus comes on the scene, the Son of God. God began to work through his ministry and through his life. Remember now, his public ministry was only three years. But God allowed folks to watch his life, and then for three years, Jesus taught how the New Testament church ought to operate, and what did he do? He handed it off to man. Matter of fact, he tells us in Matthew 28 to go. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. The mandate that was handed to us. We've talked over the last few weeks and in different meetings and in here as well. God has given us, yes, yeah, a privilege. It's a privilege of ministry. It's a privilege of worship. But it's a mandate of God. It's a mandate just like he gave Adam and Eve. It's a mandate just like he gave Noah. Just like he gave Moses. Come all the way through time to where you and I are today in 2015, and we have a mandate. And that mandate is ministry. That mandate is mission. That mandate is love. That mandate is the kingdom purpose. So we look at it today from the letter that was written by Paul to Titus. Inspired from the Holy Spirit's leadership. We looked last week, for those who were not here, the unfinished business. The church of unfinished business. I'm telling you today, folks, we are the church. And we've got multitudes of unfinished business. Great, great, great unfinished business. <clears throat> that you and I need to delve into. And so I want us to look this morning, if you would allow me, the plight of ministry, the ministry challenge, ever how you want to look at that, as we look at Paul developing this letter to Titus, a way of encouragement, but yet a way of underwriting the ministry of Titus in a difficult situation. All of the ministries that we've looked at, where it was Timothy and Ephesus, Titus and Crete, going all the way through, Paul's ministry, all their ministry was difficult. There was a challenge. And I'm telling you, our ministry is going to be difficult. God never said it was going to be easy. And so when we look at that, look at it with open eyes. I want to pick up at verse 5. That's where we left off last week. And then I want to take you through the end of the chapter. So let's look at it. The plight of ministry. It'll be on the screen. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone. And as I directed you to appoint elders in every town, someone who is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of wildness or rebellion. Holy Christian, for those that may be wanting translation this morning. For an overseer, a bishop, an elder, an overseer as God's manager, a steward, must be blameless, not arrogant, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be, both to, uh, be able both to encourage 
with sound teach teaching and to refute those who contradict it. Sounds a lot like First Timothy, right? Verse 10. For there are also many rebellious people, idle, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those from Judaism. It is necessary to silence them. They, over, they overthrow whole households by teaching or dishonest gain what they should not. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's a heck of a way to describe the folks you're associated with, huh? But it was true. Verse 13, this, this testimony is true, so rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths, myths and the com commandments of men who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and disqualified <coughs> for any good work. Join with me. Father, help us as we continue to develop the Word in our life, the wisdom, the discipline, be what you call us to be, the plight of ministry and how it applies to us. How does this apply to us? How can we take and put an application rubber meet the road? God, help us this morning to be encouraged by what you tell us. God, you get the glory this morning. Get it all, I pray. Holy Spirit of God, God, the glory that it might go straight to the throne room of God. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. A little update as far as Titus. Titus had been associated with Paul for around 15 years or so. And this letter was written by Paul to Titus after his first release or the release of his first imprisonment uh, in the Roman prison. Somewhere probably around AD 63 or AD 65. Somewhere in that, that neighborhood. And, and again, as I said a moment ago, Paul was addressing this challenge of ministry that Titus had. Uh, the, and, it, and it's there for the minister as well as those ministering. So it's there for the minister, the bishop, as well as the laity. And so we said last week that we have unfinished business, and Crete was a church that had much left to do. Uh, Titus was sent there to take care of what was undone. And that's what I was saying a moment ago. The challenge has been given to you and I to go and finish what's undone. Now one day there's going to come a completion. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return the work as we know it's going to end, and where the church is going to be raptured out of here. But right now, you and I have much unfinished business. And so, the thing is, is the church as a whole, not a denomination, but the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to come together and get the job done. Be together. Stand on the doctrine. Stand on the Word of God. It's Jesus Christ that changes lives. Some of us this morning need to understand it's not about the things out there that matter. It's about what we do in our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. When He returns or we die and we meet Him, one thing's going to matter. Not how good you are, not all that you've accomplished in life, all the accolades and the awards. No, the only thing that's going to matter is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a church, the New Testament church, that we understand that we're not going to be uniform. We talked about this on Wednesday night. Not going to be uniform, but we need to be unified in a common purpose. And that common purpose is to see the Lord Jesus Christ be lifted high, to be exalted. In about two or three weeks in Sunday school, you're going to be looking at the exaltation. Uh, we begin to deal with uh, some different topics now, moving to the dead and the resurrection and all of that. But then the exaltation. And I'm telling you, we need to come in unity, in unity understanding that we ought to come together to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. To see the Lord Jesus Christ exalted in your life and in my life. That is the goal. The fact is, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, the, the passage I actually used on Wednesday night with Gene in his ordination to the church was the fact that you and I ought to aim at pleasing God. Pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to be our constant aim. That brings unity. We're not going to be uniform. Look around. Nobody in here, there's not any twins to my knowledge in here. We don't look alike. We don't act alike. We don't eat alike. But we can be unified with the cause of Christ. 
So we look at what he's saying to Titus. We break it down this morning. In these first four or five verses, verse 5 through 9 anyway, he talks to ministers there. He's talking to Titus. Titus has been given the mandate to go and to choose bishops, overseers, elders, if you will. We have churches that are under elder ministry today in all the kinds of denominations. Uh, you may have the pastor, the bishop, you have elders, some have deacons, some don't. Uh, it depends on the setup. The, the, the fact is, is what he's given to Titus is to come and to choose those overseers that would take the place in the church of what Titus can do, multiplying himself. And so when you look at that this morning, understanding, first of all, that the minister is held to a high calling. Whether he's a pastor, whether he's an overseer, whether he's a staff, whether he's an elder, I'm telling you, that pastor, that overseer is held accountable to God. He's responsible to God as to how, where, and why he leads. That's the, that's the accountability that's set forth. God gives the vision, and then the pastor, the elder, the overseer is to communicate the vision to the church, understanding that the pastors are not perfect. He goes on and he gives some stipulations there. But we have to go, we talked about that even in men's meeting last Monday night, about perfection and the fact that we're not perfect, that pastors are not perfect. And, and no matter how hard we try, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We set a goal. I mean, when you look at it, um, those that know me, I, I'm a perfectionist. And, and sometimes that's tough. It's tough. But it's reality for me. And I have to take and deal with that on a real scale. And, and here's the thing. Pastors, and I think the reason that Paul was dealing with this was Timothy is folks have to understand that, that overseers and bishops and pastors, we have that high calling and standard, but at the same time, they're going to fail. I'm going to fail. I, and I'm going to mess up. And we're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. Some of you in here, you've been, I failed you. I disappointed you. It's not the intention. It's a high calling from God. It's not my intention that that would happen, but it's going to happen, just like you fail others. There's only been one other one that's never failed, and he put up—he was put on a cross. For it. He never made a mistake, never said a wrong word, never had a bad thought. He set a standard for us, and he went to the cross for us, so that you and I might be delivered from the process and the penalty of our sin. And all he's asked you and I to do is to bow down in obedience and surrender to him, and to let him take our sins to which he went to the cross. And we be forgiven of that in order that we might have true life. That's the significance of what he's talking about. Look what he does. He comes in. You think it's a high calling of ministry? Something not to be taken lightly. We talk about ordination. Talk about, the, I explained on Wednesday night, the setting apart, the laying on of hands. Coming out of Acts chapter 6, that, that laying on of hands is a, is a godly given uh, process to where you agree that that man is set apart, that his wife, if he's married, is set apart with him. So significant in that process. Process of accountability to the church. Process of accountability to each other. Ministry, the calling, is such a high calling based upon God's standard. He says there that he's to be the husband of one wife. Very much debate about those words and where that goes. And having faithful children, looking at your family, not being open or not being accused of wildness or, or rebellion or disobedience. That's the word there. And the reason of that being is, might well say, what is all that? I hear people say, well, he, he doesn't keep his house. Well, the thing is, the reason that's put there in Titus, when you look at that, is the fact that the minister has to have his concentration on the church. And if his family's not intact, then he can't put his full concentration on the ministry of the church. That's significant. That's why, you know, when you when you step up to the calling of ministry, when you when, when you feel the call to ministry, when you feel the call to be a worship leader on the platform, whether we realize it or not, we set a standard. When we feel and we say to a staff member, hey, I feel called to play, I feel called to sing, I feel called as a calling from God not to be taken lightly. We looked upon that on Saturday, on Wednesday, that we shouldn't come and we shouldn't take it lightly in the fact of ministry. And the wife is called, Slim is called the same calling I am. In, in Gene's case, Jeanette, called it the same calling. And every deacon's wife, and every pastor's wife, and every staff wife, you're called to the same calling. 
God doesn't call one without the other. And it's so significant when we look at that. We don't miss that. And then you come together and why that's in there about your children because you want your house to water so you can give the full um, uh, potential that you have under God's uh, leadership unto the church to which you serve. It's significant in that. And those of us that have had children going through difficulties, you know the burden that it puts upon you. You know how it weighs you down. You go through those difficult times and then you see your son or daughter or grandchildren come around and get their life in order. And it's like just a big load that comes off of them. That's what he's talking about there to your children. That the fact that they're, they're, they, that they have, um, they're not wild and they're not rebellious. Look what he says there that, that the overseer, verse 7, it is a, a good steward. He's God's manager. We, we miss that. He, he's a servant of the church. He, 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 he's there to serve the church, but he's entrusted to God's work. Man, I'm telling you, that's been something I, I don't know how we missed that throughout the years. When we look at the calling of a pastor or a staff member, and, and we tend to put man over him. Not that he's not accountable to him, but the fact is it's a direct responsibility to God as an under-shepherd. We'll call it an under-shepherd, but yet it's like we have to live on the planet. That's, that's why we have so many difficult times because we, we want it to be man's way instead of God's way. It's significant. The calling of God to be a minister, to be a servant of the church, to be a steward. I mean, thinking about the fact of the authority of God is placed upon that pastor. It's placed upon that overseer. It's placed upon that bishop of that church. And, and, and to be, what he says, go on with me there. You must be blameless. Above reproach, <coughs> to be able to be examined and to be true, uh, uh, to, to be uh, undefiled, not arrogant, not a bully, <coughs> controlled temper. You see where it seems to fail. You see what comes in and people push the button. Not addicted to wine, literally, not a drunkard. Not greedy for money. All of that. You know, you, you come down and you see, but he needs to be hospitable. That, that word up there, by the way, bully, it has the word literally violence. It has to be one that's not dishonest, one that's trustworthy. Uh, no pastor will like conflict or likes to be a part of conflict. The lover of what is good, deeds and the things of life, self-control, control of mind, control of emotions. You see the responsibilities that are placed there, able to respond rationally and at times discreetly. Upright. That's the conduct before God. That's a, that, that word holy there, the devout, the, the righteous, the conduct before God, found just before God, the found, uh, found devout, self control. Word there has to do in that sexual sense, but at the same time, of your own desires and your own pleasure, to be self control. I, I don't have a problem with you. I can bring my laptop in here, I can bring my phone in here, and I can lay it on this table. And tell you to come and look at anything you want to look at here. And I can tell you, you won't find pornography. You won't find bad language. I told Gene this morning, we were talking in the office. And we were talking about that very thing. And I, and I told him, I said, you have to be careful who you accept your friends on Facebook. <coughs> because you, you, sometimes you'll, you'll put on there and you'll friend them and then you'll find out, oh wow. And what I find, and, and some of you, if you put language, I don't message you back public. I message you in an inbox so I can say, hey, you may want to rethink how you put this. Amen. I mean, I'm going to bring it. But it's significant to our integrity. And our computers, listen, every guy in here, every woman in here ought to be willing to lay their phone down and say, if you want to go through it, go through it. That ought to be the integrity we have. That's one of our issues inside our homes and our marriages and our lives. We want to hold it. We want to hide it. When's the last time that you went through your Facebook friends and you actually looked at who you had friended and what pictures are on their website? It's a high calling. And I don't discount that. 
I told you my testimony, how God, I, I refused. I spent our in ministry. We're doing what I felt like we ought to be doing. God was wanting more, and I wrestled with him, and wrestled with him, and wrestled with him, and wrestled with him for months before I said, yes, Lord, I got it. Because it's a significant calling. And when you think about all of this, and, and I've heard someone even say this week, I don't think I would ever want to be a minister. Or in the place of a pastor. I asked you this morning, you feel the call of ministry? Because there's days that all you have is your calling. Uh, it, it's the fact of just where you are. And every pastor, every ministry, uh, every missionary is in great need of the prayers of the body. Great need of support. That's what he's coming down. Uh, and, and the purpose there, even if you look at, at chapter verse 9 there, the purpose there is doctrinal fidelity. you got to hold to something or you'll fall for anything. I have people argue this thing about doctrine. Guys, listen, if we don't get on to the Bible, if we don't understand the Bible, you're going to fall for every little Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Susie, and all that that comes along. If it sounds good, you're going to get on the train. Somewhere or another, we've got to look at the deciphering part, the, the, uh, the fact that God given us discernment Amen. so we'll know what God really wants in our life. That's why doctrine is there. That's the purpose of doctrine. It's not a purpose to argue about. It's the fact that so we'll know what we believe so when the wind blows here and over, you won't just go with it. Amen. You'll be anchored to something that's strong. That being the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there's days in the ministry uh, to where all you have is the call of God, either your own doing or somebody else's. It's a difficult thing, and that's what Paul was trying to prepare Titus to prepare those that he was about to make bishops or overseers or elders. It's a serious thing when one feels a call to ministry. It's a serious thing when one feels called led to be a deacon. It's a serious thing when somebody called, feels led to be a Sunday school teacher. It's a serious thing when somebody feels called to be a worship leader, a youth minister, or a, a, somebody to play drums or keyboards or guitars or hold a microphone and sing. If God gave you the voice, then he gave it to you to glorify him. But it's a serious thing when you pick it up and you stand in front of somebody. First of all, God's your audience. We take it very lightly. And we just kind of rub smut in God's eyes when we do it our way instead of this way. And that's what Paul was saying to Titus this morning. But let, let, me, let me just go ahead and take it on a little bit further. Ministers are held to a high calling. But I want you to look at verse 10 through 12. Second, ministers are there, but they need the help of others. You need the help of others. And I want you to see now what was going on here. Look what's going on. Don't, don't miss this because some of you are going to say, well, that's not what he's talking about. But it is. Look at it. He's saying, for those, uh, for there are also many rebellious people, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those from Judaism. What he's talking about there are the Jews, but he's talking about the legalistic, Pharisaic, Sadducee kind of thought there. That's what he's talking about. Keeping the church back. He said it's necessary to silence him. And he goes on and he, and he talks about that. Then he, that's when he makes a statement. One of their very own said, Christians are liars, evil beasts, and gluttons. So when you look at that, I want you to understand he's dealing with the fact of the rebellious, the false teachers, and the misleading. And he says, look, don't give them a platform. Don't even give them opportunities. Shut them down where they are because they're not saying what God wants them to say. They're looking for man's glorification and not God's glorification. And so what happens there when you look at that, what he's telling Titus is that you've got to have people behind you that, that, that learn the Word of God, that are part of the Word of God, that want to see ministry go forward, not idle talkers or deceivers, none of that, but those that are on board with the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that are willing to see the kingdom of God go forward. Amen. That's why he puts so much emphasis on the fruit in the New Testament. You don't, again, we're talking, the fact is you don't have to judge somebody by their character. You look at the fruit that's producing, you'll know where they are. You'll know if they're carnal, you'll know if they're on fire, you'll know they're not even close. You look at all of that, it's significant. So you might be saying, well, you know, ask yourself a question, how can I help? What, what, what do I need to do to get involved? How, how, matter of fact, we take it a step further. How does God what is God saying to you? I, I 
mean, the fact is that the pastor uh, and, the, and, and the staff cannot, cannot, cannot do it alone. That's why I put so much emphasis on the body. And when you've got the rebellion going on, it even escalates. Praise God, we don't have that. It's significant. I mean, think about now the old guy, the, the, the prophet. At least he was being honest. What did he, he tell Titus? I mean, you may say, well, he's pretty harsh, but at least he was being honest when he said, look, these creatures, they're liars and beasts and weapons. Sometimes you just got to call it like you see it. And that's exactly what he did. No Titus, man, he had a job to do, and I'm telling you, we've got a job to do. How does God do? Let me, let me propose this question to you. Was it man code on Wednesday, on Monday night? Listen to this. If every, I should have put it on the screen. If everybody else contributed as much as you contributed, would the church be stronger? Would it be weaker? About the same or out of business? Think about that. If, if everybody in the church contributed like you do, whether it's money, time, talents, whatever, would the church be stronger, weaker, about the same, or out of business? It's thought-provoking. Let me uh, I just say to you, you know, as a pastor, I, uh, we need your help. We need you on board. Titus needs people on board. We need you on board. And, and you know, somebody might say, well, if I'm, a, if I'm not a member yet, can I get on board? Yeah, there's certain areas you can't. Sir, I understand that. But other areas, if God leads you, you can get on board. So ministry is not made to be alone. That's why I say God didn't create you to be a loner. God didn't create me to be a loner. Even though ministry at times are long, it's lonely. And it's fun to get the phone call. It's fun to get the letter that's that's encouraging. It's not so fun when you get a brass email or a brass text or a little note from the sign. It's not fun. But it's reality. So we look at ministers. They got a high calling. We look at the fact that they need the help of others. And then verse 13 or, or 12 through 16. I'm going to close with this. It goes for every one of us in here. And I, I want to caution you right here because I want to say a word in, I want to speak a word in your life if I can, if God will allow me. The last thing this morning is for you and I to remember that our actions speak louder than our words. You can tell me that you love me, but if you don't show me, if you do everything contradictory, your words didn't mean anything. I can tell you that I love you, but if my actions don't show that I love you, you're not going to go very far. Here's the other thing. I was talking with another pastor this week, and, and, and he said, uh, I, I told our people that when you're in the community, don't say one negative thing about the kingdom of God or about the church. Amen. Don't ever complain about the church. Don't, don't complain to God and, and, and all of that about the church. Especially if you're not actively involved because our actions speak louder than our words. And, and, and let me just make another statement to you, a, a question, as I asked you a moment ago. This is out of the Manco book as well. He, he followed that first question up. Here's what he said. Besides money, can you list, and I don't want the Sunday school answer. As a matter of fact, I don't want you to answer at all. You may turn your Bible and your bulletin over and write this worship got over Besides money, can you list at least three other ways you contributed to the life of your church during the last six months? Besides money. Three ways that you commit, that you uh, poured into the life of your church, you contributed in the last six months. Think about that. Three ways. That's all he's asking for. Some of you are not members That's fine. If you're going somewhere else, can you list three ways of the that you contributed to your church outside of money. See, God equips us. And God gives us the ability to do the things that He wants us to do. And, and then the follow-up to that when you get on board. Because here's what He says. Now, don't miss this, man. We're, we're, we're about to close. Now, I want you to the, He tells us as Christians to be pure in our actions. To be very pure in everything that we do. Because he says to the pure, everything is pure. To those that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. He goes on to say, they are those that are unpure are detestable, disobedient, and disqualified. That word detestable, detestable, 
When you look at the Word of God in the New Testament, you find that they do the sacrifice at the altar, and it says that the aroma was a uh, sweet aroma to the nostrils of God. The word detestable is exactly the opposite of that. And what he says, if we live life with impurity, then our words are a staunch smell to the nostrils of God. Think about that. I mean, all of us have been in places to where you walk in and you see something you want to go. That's detestable. But the, the, the sweet aroma, our life, that's, that's the that's a desire that we're pure in our action, that our actions speak louder. And, and what he says is, you may claim to fully know, but your actions deny it. Don't miss that. They may claim to fully know. They, verse 16, the first part, they profess to know God, but they deny Him by their actions, by their works. Think about that now. Think about the significance of that for our life today. We're talking about the ministry challenge. See, it's easy to come in here and cross our hands and put on our clothes and feel comfortable and look good and everything's all right. And then we go out there. We go to the ship yard. We go to the schools. Or we go to the restaurant. Things don't go right. Or we go to Walmart. Or we get cut off at the red light. I got a text from my buddy Mike Green, who was in Jackson the other day, and he said, I sure wish God would take slow people out of my way. <laughs> Sorry, I'm with you, brother. I know what you think. But, you know, you think about that. I mean, I'm telling you, here's the deal. What he's saying, you may claim to love God. I love God. I love Jesus. What a moment. What are Romans coming? As you're living the sacrifice every day. What, what are Romans to the nostrils of God? Oh, I love his church. Three things that you've done before to the life of the church without giving you money. See, that, that's what tells us the fruit is there. The actions, do they show it? Are our motives pure? Or are they underlying? Am I just doing this for some other reason? Do I want to slip out? Do I not want to be a part? Do I want to just come because I feel like I've got to? Sometimes we come because we feel like we've got to, and that's a good thing because we're obedient to God, and today we don't feel like coming, but we come out of obligation to God. And that's significant because our job ought to be to please the Master. 2 Corinthians 5 9. My life would be pleasing to Him, that we get out of bed so we can please the Lord. That's the ministry challenge. That we literally pray, God, fill that building up. God, put us outside the parking lots. God, do what you got to do. God, surprise us, God. Do what you will. God, I want to get on board. Will you surrender? Will you give it to God? God, I'll do it. God, I'll, whatever it is, God, I want to get on board. The opportunity's there. I just say yes. Support your staff. Support your pastor. Support the ministry challenge. Support the fact and understand that God is watching us. We talked this week. One day we're going to do an account. I'm a believer, Pastor. I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But one day you and I are going to stand before the Master and we're going to give an account. We're going to give an account for our thought processes, our actions, and how we live. And understanding that God loves you. God cares about you. God cares about us. He cares enough about His church and the world that He's given us the mandate, the ministry challenge. And he never said it was going to be easy, but he told us to ford the creeks, climb the mountains, go through the scrapes and the bruises and the cuts and the disappointments and the pastors that you don't like, those that you do like, the music, you know, all this kind of stuff is fluff. Just be quiet with God. That's what he says. So I ask you to bow your head and ask the praise team to make your way up. As you bow your head, and I just want to listen to you, I think they... Just a challenge to someone this morning who may have never made a profession of faith. You see, your first step in getting it right with God is a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the thing right there. The Bible tells us that all is sin and comes short of the glory of God. It tells us the weight of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life is kind of wrong. It says that God demonstrated his love for you. 
that He sent His Son Jesus and He died on the cross so that you might have life and that life more abundantly. He speaks to Christians and He says that you'll confess your sin and you'll believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God. That God raised you from the dead. That your sins will be forgiven. They will be removed from the heart of each this will be rest. He says you'll know that you're Christians because by the love that you show, by the fruit that you produce. This morning you may say, Pastor, I've never made that profession of faith. I've never, I've never cried out to Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I don't even remember having life changed. You do that this morning, first and foremost this morning. And it would do something like this. Lord Jesus, I want to change my life, but I, I want to put my faith and trust in you. And I want to give you ownership of me, God. And you take full ownership, God, and lead me. I surrender my life to you right now. Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I accept that. And I ask him to forgive me. To cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Somebody, Pastor, I prayed that prayer a long time ago, but wow. Just being honest. My fruit had been very good lately. My fruit hadn't been what it needs to be, and, and right now I just need to ask God to forgive me, and I want to get where I need to be. I want to join the team. I want to get on the team, Jesus. I want to be a part of this church. I want to love and support this church or my church. Where do you go? Would you do that? Would you make that commitment for me? God, I made a mess of things. God, God, I've had an offense. Somebody offended me. God, I want to, right now, God, I want to seek your forgiveness. And then I need to ask that person for forgiveness. Or maybe, God, I know they've forgiven me, so I need to forgive them so I can go on in life. It's a ministry challenge. It's a flight of ministry. It's not easy as a minister. Ministers need other people. This morning, maybe your prayer is, God, I want to get on board. God, I'm one of those guys that can't write down three things that I've done. I'm one of those ladies, I'm one of those young people that I can't write down three things that I've done in six months. God, something's wrong. God, I need to get where I need to be. God, I, my actions doesn't match my words. God, I, I've told people I love Jesus, I've done this, but God, my actions are just that match. The movies I look at, the stuff's on my laptop, my, my phone, the stuff I participate in, God, it, it's not matching. <laughs> God, I need you right now to forgive me. I need you to cleanse me. I need you, God, to turn this thing around. Through all this, somebody might say, God, I know you call me ministry. And I accept that call this morning. A lot of other things on your mind this morning. You want somebody to pray with you, we'll get somebody to pray with you. These altars are open. You don't have to be a member. You can come and glorify the Lord. It's freedom. Lead us in a word of prayer. We're going to stand. We're going to have a public invitation. I'll be down for one. Would you let God lead you this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, our aim ought to be pleasing to you. So, God, I pray this morning, as your under shepherd, God, I pray for the mighty work of God. I pray, God, that we pull together. We see the kingdom change. And I pray God it start one life at a time. For that person, Lord, who walked in this building not knowing Jesus is Lord and Savior today, God, as you draw that they would respond. For that carnal Christian, Lord, that church member that cries out, I know God, I know Jesus, but life outside of here don't really matter. God, I pray this morning you'll be a change. God, it's invitation time. It's your time. I've done everything I can under your leadership for the your work this morning. God is about you. And I give it to you right now. Right now. Stand with me.